All right, so let's spend the rest of our lives chasing something we want to chase. Uh, <laughs> today, I've got John Driscoll on the show, and John has agreed to be on the show. We're going to talk a little bit about what worked for him in 2019, what he thinks 2020 looks like, specifically in the app world, and he's got some other unique insights he's going to share today. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you want me to tackle the 2019, what worked for me in 2019? What worked? What do you do? How did it work? What, what were the things? What was everything? So, you know, our primary, primarily my job is to create downloads, right? Uh, we obviously want to create downloads. We have other, you know, uh, metrics that we look for depending on the app, right? They're all mm -hmm. specific to the type of app. Um, one of the apps we've been working on is a fintech based app. So it's a savings app. It's called Guac. Go download it. Sorry, no plugs. <laughs> Link in the first comment below. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so it, yeah, it's in, it, it's been in beta during 2019. So we, we play with a lot of things and, you know, we, we definitely like growth hacking, but we also are spending money too. So we're mm -hmm. trying to just figure out where we can get our dollars. But one of the things we really got into was, because we were chasing a, a demographic that liked memes a lot, mm -hmm. you know? So we uh, contacted some influencers mm -hmm. that had massive followings of memes and they had never b been paid to do anything. We just contacted them, they had mm -hmm. 3 million followers and we said, hey, you think we could partner with you and sponsor your program or have you guys mention us or whatever. And first time we did it, we got like 500 downloads in one day. It was crazy. So, um, and because of our ad dollars, what we were spending with Facebook and Instagram, it was insane difference in what it was going to cost us. Mm -hmm. So I would say we were, we were paying basically 10 cents on the dollar, you know, for what we were used to spending. So even though we're paying the influencer, it's such small amounts of money. It's, it's crazy, you know, how effective it was. So we've, since contacted many, many more <laughs> to try to see uh, who else would be interested in. It's going really well. Yeah. My question for you is, it, it sounds like you uncovered an opportunity. You said this was somebody that um, wasn't used to getting these types of requests. They had built a, an authentic following and, and yeah, they, they'd never. So how, how do you make sure that it's fair and that everybody wins? I'm, I'm curious. You mean as far as the the listener? I mean, how do you price that? How do you price that out? How do you say, hey, what am I going to give you a couple hundred dollars? Like, how does that? We work? ask them. I, <laughs> I know some of the the big time influencers, the guys that are the, you know, they are they can charge as much as fifty thousand dollars. I've seen those numbers before. for what for a single. Um, I think it's for more of a relationship over the course of a month, mm -hmm. but um, essentially fifty thousand a month is what I've seen. The numbers I've seen. I've never paid that. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, those are just the numbers I've seen with some New York firms that I've talked to. So um, these influencers had no price. <laughs> so we just said, hey, what would you charge us? And, you know, uh, it was, you know, insane. They were charging us like 1500 bucks, mm. you know, and one post could get 500 downloads. So you do the math. It's insane. You know, if you can, we were running $27 for a bank connectivity. That's our ultimate you know, um, metric that we look for is mm -hmm. download then bank connectivity. We want them to connect their bank. That's partially, that's what the app does. It saves for people. So that was the big number we were looking for. And we were told that that number was way below industry averages. Mm -hmm. um, so for us to get those kind of numbers was mm -hmm. insane. Yeah, it was uh, crazy. So now we've, um, we haven't abandoned Facebook and Instagram Ads, mm -hmm. but we are definitely trying to uh, connect with as many uh, influencers out there as we can. Yeah. Awesome. It really sounds like a win-win. And how are you going to apply that in, in 2020? And what are some ideas for how this audience can maybe mm -hmm. tap into that power a little bit? Yeah, I think it, you know, it tells you a lot about, um, the best thing it does is it tells you a lot about your audience, right? I think, you know, the data should be speaking to you. And the data is that our audience um, 
the age group of our audience loves memes. So I was like, well, why aren't we doing those? We should do that ourselves. Like that should tell us about our content. Is there a way, because I don't think today it's enough in the industry to sell a product. I just don't think you can do that anymore. I think mm. you have to start a movement. And if you aren't starting movement, you're just wasting your time most of the mm. time. You know, I, I just think that's how business is now. So you gotta pick a cause. And I think our cause is trying to help young people save money. Mm. That is a real cause. That's what that app is created for. In fact, I was the one who came up with the, the idea. Mm. I was, uh, you know, on, you know, writing on my, my shower window and came up with the concept of how we were gonna help people to save money. And um, so when we did that, um, you know, I, I had a theory, but now that we're reaching out and we're understanding those people, we understand now what kind of content they like. Mm. So I think now that tells us what kind of content we need to do. So we're starting to do more YouTube videos and stuff like that, but I think we understand more about our audience um, by reaching out to these influencers. Yeah, if I'm hearing you correctly, it, it seems like you have to try some things in order to understand the audience and based on those results, adjust your strategy moving forward. Absolutely. You know, it's... Uh, Versus overthinking it in the beginning. <laughs> absolutely. Well, that's what everybody does, right? right? Like, um, the biggest problem in consulting is all the clients you work with think that they're right, mm. you know? And uh, I remember a campaign years ago where uh, they wanted to do all these custom photos for athletes. Mm. And we were doing a young person campaign for young athletes. And they wanted to do custom photos, so they spent all this money going out and taking custom mm. photos of all these young people that, you know, and the athletes. And then once we started running campaigns, we found that the young people didn't respond to these photos at all. They mm. wanted to see people working out, not in their athletic gear, but just working out. Mm. And it, it was funny just to see that just small difference. The data was completely lopsided, mm. you know, that. So I think the lesson is always let the data dictate what you're doing. Don't go out thinking you're right. I, I, I tell everybody that we work with, I have no idea. <laughs> let's go let's let the data tell us mm. you know what's what's going on let's not try to think that we know these people we don't know them mm. you know and i think that's the biggest mistake most marketers make mm. what what's your story me personally yeah yeah so uh i said to you i'm probably older than most people here but maybe not <laughs> so i started um in financial services totally unrelated. Um, but as I did financial services and I started my own company when I was about 27, I wanted to obviously get clients. And so uh, I started to really become a marketer. And even though I didn't really like financial services, I learned a lot about how to market financial services mm -hmm. and how to you know, differentiate ourself, ourselves as our company um, and we just decided to do everything different than everybody else. And I think that's the lesson I learned back then was look at what the market is doing and don't do that. Mm. Do the opposite. Um, be different. Don't be afraid to be different. And, um, you know, back in those days, we just did it. We did everything different. And so I look, you know, my company was thankfully a wild success. And in 06, right before everything got a little nutty, I got out and I decided to chase my dream in tech. And mm. I was already building software in the financial game. I was mm. already marketing in the financial game, but I knew I wanted to be more on the tech sector, the marketing sector. So I went into consulting for a couple of years, didn't know what I was doing, that's kind mm -hmm. of a mess. And um, 2008, March 6, 2008, mm. I was watching uh, Steve Jobs talk about the iPhone and he released the App Store that day. And that changed my life, you know, completely changed my life. I went in the other room and told Jason, my partner now, and I said, hey, we got to stop everything. We got to change everything. We got to figure out how to make apps. And uh, that's what we've been doing ever since. You know, a lot of people describe that moment in history of Steve walking out on stage and 
it, very pivotal. Has there been another pivotal moment like that for you and your business? Oh gosh, probably so many. Um, <laughs> I think um, that one was big, you know. Changed the world. It did. Well, you know, there was two big moments that Steve had, right? There was the one the year before when he announced the iPhone. That was 2007. But that whole time, he had never talked about a store. Mm -hmm. He could only have the apps. People always forget that now. You could only have the Apple apps. That was it. You had like, I think it was 12, right? That was all that was on your phone. And then the next year, he's like, we're going to release this to the world. We're going to let you guys make it. And I think that was... That was the biggest moment, yeah, because I started to think about what was possible. Um, I'd say another big one was when Facebook released their marketing platform. I was on that webinar as well that day. Mm. That was the first one. And they talked about, you know, releasing this advertising platform. And I know that's not necessarily growth hacking, but um, I was pretty fascinated at the data that they had mm. and how we were going to be able to tap into that data. And I, I figured they had the best data of what was out there, essentially. If you like something, you were telling a lot about who you are. Mm. That's where it started. And we were giving Facebook all this information. Now people are kind of regretting that. But we were doing it very freely, right? Mm. We were telling them so much about us. And um, now I think there's a big pushback and I think we're gonna, we're gonna see it go the other way mm. a little bit. Um, it's a concept I haven't heard anybody say this, so I'll say it first. I call it private social. I think we're going to see a private version of social where we have more privacy built into it, but we're still socializing with the people we care about. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe hopefully it's smaller groups. I, I really hate the idea of too many people. Yeah, I have to be honest with you. Um, I've had to get off of Facebook and Instagram and I've gone a lot into text messages and, mm -hmm. and just iMessage in general, group chats and individual communication is where I spend most of my time and it is a private social network. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, Gary Vee's been talking about this. If you follow him, he actually published his phone number, you know, published it. And I'm like, wow, that blew my mind. But I think that's where what you're talking about. Clearly, texting is the most public, I mean, private thing that we have as far as relationship wise, socially. And you're right. I think, you know, we're going into that direct place where we're trying to shut people out, you know, and say, Hey, I don't, I don't want 5 million followers. I want mm -hmm. people who seriously are in my life, you know, or, or really serious fans. So to, to, to bring it to a, a, a close here, Let's say I have an, an MVP or a proof of concept. I've raised some funding. You know, I've got a team. We're, we're, we're going out. What should I be doing for 2020? You know, what's, what, what do I need to look out for? As an app company? As an app company. Yeah. So, well, I would even back up more. Um, we like to, I like to meet people before they have funding. Person. So what's the earliest stage you like to meet people? At idea stage. Mm. Yeah, I think we're very unique when it comes to that. We're actually doing a webinar next week on that very topic. If you have no money, mm -hmm. you have no idea. That's when I want to meet you. I like to see people who are more hustler because it's more about the person. Mm. It's, ideas, they they grow on trees. You know, they're everywhere. Um, and money, there's always somebody who will invest in a great product. There's tons of those people. But great hustlers, people who are growth hackers like mm. yourself, like those people are unique. Mm. You know, and when I find one of those, that's a company I want to invest in. That's something I want to be involved with, you know. And that's why we only work with 10 companies a year. So we, mm. we used to do 50. Now we only do 10. Right. So we're very selective. And it's all based on the person. I can solve your idea. I can solve your tech. I can solve all. If we can solve the money problem, I can't change you. Hmm. That's the problem. It's really fascinating that you say that. And I'll probably share something that's you know 
don't know if it was confidential or not, but last last night I was having a board meeting for, for OC Tech and we were all together looking at, okay, what's going to be our plan for 2020? And I'm being asked the question, you know, being the founder of this, okay, so what worked and, you know, who, who is the audience and at what stage we were looking at the stages of, of people. And, you know, I, I had to reframe that. I said, no, I, we never looked for what stage you were in. I wanted to differentiate the people that were doing something versus not doing something. Mm -hmm. And then put together an environment where you have a nuclear reactor of people doing something and then create momentum behind that. Because I 100% believe what you're saying. It is the person, you can solve the money problem. You're not going to solve the ethics and the hustle and all those things that keep keep that contained. Yeah. If you if you pour a bunch of money on something that is, you know, not foundationally secure, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. I you know, it's funny, I met some guys and I won't specifically mention their company, uh, maybe they'd like me to, but um I met them recently and they had, you know, the shittiest tech I've ever seen. Um, it was really, really bad. And they taped it together with a Wix site, you know, and um, it was just a mess, but they had sold accounts, they had users. Mm -hmm. They were doing more with nothing than I've seen people do with $10 million. And those are the opportunities. That's the opportunity, yeah. It's not, you know, getting, like I said, getting funding, that's super possible. Put a good deck together and you can get funding, mm -hmm. you know, but even VCs, what they're really looking for is a person, mm -hmm. you know, the, the idea, you know, everybody's looking for an original idea. Fuck original ideas. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not, a, it's not about <laughs> original ideas because really, mm -hmm. um, you know, in and out didn't invent the cheeseburger. Mm -hmm. you, they just make it better than everybody else. Get, I would rather see somebody go after a market that's already there and make it better than them, mm -hmm. than to try to come out with something original that we don't even know if people are gonna want. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's where people miss it. They just, they think it has to, and because it's tech, we we changed all the business rules we, for some reason. We think there's only gonna be one of all these companies. That's mm -hmm. not true, who mm -hmm. said it? Who said that? Mm -hmm. I, I don't believe that at all, you know? Right now, I'm I'm in a, involved in a startup. I own four app companies. I don't run any of them because I run the development company. Mm -hmm. So I have to have good people that I rely on to run those companies. So one of them that I'm involved in, um, we're launching in Miami and we're going directly after the competition. And they're, they already have $12 million. They're way ahead of us. They're in six markets. I don't care. That doesn't bother me at all. In fact, what we're going to do um, is we're going to meet all their people because they're contractors and we're going to see if they want to work for us. Mm. You know, how many Uber drivers only work for Uber? They don't. They work for Uber and Lyft. Mm -hmm. So why not do the same thing? Is that the future of, and I know we're going over time a little bit off topic, sure. but is that the future of employment? Because I, I, I feel that way where it makes no sense to have one job. It, 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 it's, it's literally just a time waste to fill your week with 40 hours of, you know, like if you get it done in 10, why can't you spend the other 30 doing other things too? I think as long as you're focused, I think yeah. some jobs work off of the other, right? Um, I think in marketing, that's what you're trying to do. If you're, if you're attracting um, a user or a mm. client or whatever that is, you would hope that you could offer them multiple things mm -hmm. in that process. Um, if you can only offer them one thing, that really kind of limits what you can do. So I think mm -hmm. it should be a progressive relationship where you can solve a lot of their problems. Like we do app development, but we also handle the marketing. We are a front to back app making business. You know, mm -hmm. that's what we do. So when people are looking for us, there's nothing else to compare us to. Mm -hmm. We're the only thing out there. Mm -hmm. um, I call the other ones app vendors to be a little mean. That's the way I see it. They make your app and they say goodbye. We do it a different way. So I think in, in relation, you know, going back to what you're saying, yeah, there should be multiple things that you're doing and hopefully they're still serving the same people. I think to me, that's ideal. 
Well, you heard it from John. Um, <laughs> it's about serving people, uncovering those hidden opportunities, looking for drive and character over anything else. I think this was a really important episode. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks awesome. for inviting me. Take care. Yeah. I didn't know how long we were going. No, very nice. <laughs> Good. Well, that was, that Good. was really cool.